And so as we begin, uh, one of the greatest things about God's creation of mankind is the fact that each of us were created unique. The other day I was driving down my driveway and there was a herd of deer that were there that I kind of scared away I was, I was going by the driveway. And, and as I was thinking about it, I was like, man, every single one of these deer look exactly the same, right? Other than some might have antlers and some don't. But when it comes to like a lot of these animals, it's like you can never really tell which one is which. Aren't you glad that as human beings, God has created us each unique and different, and there's no two people that are in all of the seven billion plus people on planet Earth that are exactly the same. Psalm 139 makes it clear that God formed each of us in our mother's womb, and when he was finished, he threw away the mold. And I'm so thankful for anybody else's sake that nobody's exactly like me, right? And so all of us are unique. All of us are different. And even though they say that everybody has a look-alike out there somewhere, when you boil it down, they may look similar to you, but they are not like you in any way. And so all of us are unique. All of us are different. And as you think about your family, families also are so different. And one of the things that really sets families apart today is the various traditions adopted by each family. If you think about your family, you probably have different traditions that have meant something to you over the years. Maybe as you were growing up, your family had traditions. Maybe now, if you're an adult, you have traditions with your own family. So anybody want to just share in a tradition that uh, some kind of community involvement here, some uh, crowd interaction, anybody have a tradition that they just really consider special in their family that's really meant something to them over the years? If not, you don't have to share, but I'm just curious. I'm going to share a couple of mine, so i figure got to give you the opportunity. Yeah. Football, the whole family on Sundays. All right, awesome. All right, awesome. So football on Sunday afternoons, that's a good tradition. Um, anybody else? Traditions that they just love? Maybe just the holiday traditions or spiritual traditions or other family traditions? Yeah. Okay, family football match. Your family's big enough. You probably have enough to split up teams and to do it that way. All right, awesome. And mom's team, I'm sure, always wins, right? Mom's team always wins. No? Okay. Well, you know, I figured it was worth a try since mom was sitting there. Anybody else have a, a tradition that means something to their family that they really just enjoy now that we've broken the ice? No, you guys are just boring, don't really have any traditions, or you don't want to share? Yeah. Okay. Okay, yeah, the young adults take a trip here at the church. That's kind of become an annual tradition. Good. All right, so that's church family ready. Anybody else? traditions that mean something to you or that you're thankful for that are special to you. I know for me growing up, one of the things I always uh, loved was uh, on New Year's Eve. Um, it was my parents' anniversary, but it was also an opportunity that we would go and me and my siblings and my cousins, we'd all spend the night at my grandparents' house. And so as little kids, we would go and we'd all just camp out on their floor and we would stay up if we could and wait till midnight to watch the ball drop and go out and, and let off fireworks and things like that. And from the time I was a little kid to the time I was even a teenager, maybe even into college, I remember just going and just enjoying that time on New Year's Eve, getting to spend with my cousins at my grandparents' house. And then now, being a parent of uh, five kids myself, Jen and I are constantly looking for different things that can kind of become tradition, some that we've uh, you know, kept and some that have started out to be traditions that we haven't kept and things like that. But one of the things we've started lately around our family is, um, obviously, we, we try to do devotions at some, to some extent with our kids, but uh, you know, with the kids our age, sometimes it's just a matter of if they can sit still and listen to something, we've made progress, right? And so I don't want you to think that this is some like super spiritual sanctimonious time at the Gailey household where everybody's sitting there, you know, with their hands together. No, a lot of times it's kids running around, hey, sit down. And if we get through something, it's a win. And for a while we were trying to do like read a Bible story or something at night before bedtime, but we found like that was just getting hard because some kids take longer to get ready for bed than others. Other nights you're just ready to get kids in bed. It's like, okay, you're in bed, good, I'm just done and I'm moving on to something else, right? And so we've decided to try at dinner time as everybody's finished before they get seconds, right? Because some of our kids like to eat. We try to do something. We have a little devotional that we read. And we've also been trying to ask them kind of questions 
um, as a way, kind of like a little catechism thing to help them understand. And so it's been neat to see my kids kind of catch on, uh, you know, to some of those things. And so every night at dinner, I'll ask a see, you know, we'll read the devotion. We'll, we've started like singing a song and trust me, it is not melodious in any way. And if we get through like a course, we're doing good. So, but we've been trying to do some of these things. And I'll ask my kids questions. I, I picked this up at Iron Sharpens Iron. I heard somebody talk about it. And I'm like, man, that is genius because you're helping teach your kids, you know, just certain things that are going to stick with them. And so every night I've been asking my kids for a set of five questions. I'll say, you know, things like, why did God give us the Bible? And they'll answer, uh, so, I just forgot the end, no, to help us guide our lives, right? That's what they'll say. And so I'll say, why did God make you strong? And they say, to help the weak. Why did God make you rich? To help the poor. Why did God make you smart and capable? To give him the glory. And I'll say, why did God give us a voice? And they'll say, to praise the Lord. And so it's small things that I'm hoping are becoming a tradition in our home that will mean something to them as they go out in life. And traditions can be an important thing. It's what sometimes helps set families apart. And I say all that about traditions because here in Mark chapter 2, we are going to come across some religious traditions that Jesus is going to poke some holes in. Some religious traditions that some of these Pharisees and these religious leaders of the day were elevating to this high level, and Jesus is going to step on the scene and help them say, hey, you are living for all these traditions, but there's so much more that you're missing outside of these traditions. So in our passage today, we're going to see one of many instances where the religious traditions of the Pharisees blinded them from seeing the truth about who Jesus was. And this is going to be a common theme that we are going to see not only in Mark, but really all throughout the Gospels, these Pharisees who elevate these traditions over the truth of God's word. For example, let me give you some scripture here. Mark 7 verse 8 says, you leave the commandment of God and hold to the tradition of of men. There Jesus is speaking specifically to the Pharisees. Matthew chapter 23, it says this, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you tithe mint and dill and cumin and have neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice and mercy and faithfulness. These you ought to have done without neglecting the others. You blind guides, straining out a gnat and swallowing a camel. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you clean the outside of the cup and the plate, but inside they are full of greed and self-indulgence. You blind Pharisee, first clean the inside of the cup and the plate, that the outside also may be clean. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are like whitewashed tombs, which outwardly appear beautiful, but within are full of dead people's bones and all uncleanness. So you also outwardly appear righteous to others, but within you are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. And so all throughout the Gospels, we see Jesus confronting the religious leaders of his day, saying, woe to you Pharisees. You're doing all these external things on the outside, focusing on all these actions outwardly, but you're missing the most important thing, is that is the inner condition of your heart. And so we see that here in Mark chapter 2 as they are going to confront Jesus about a couple of issues that they notice about Jesus' disciples compared to the way that they have been taught and they believe you should be living. And so they were focused on these man-made traditions so much so that they were missing the Messiah that was right in front of them. And unfortunately, I believe there are many of us today who are also missing the kind of life that Jesus offers because we are stooped in some sort of religious tradition or some sort of legalism that is keeping us from enjoying the kind of life that God wants us to live. And so if you're taking notes and you want a title today, the title is simply this, Missing the Forest for the Trees, because that's essentially what these Pharisees were doing. They were focused on all these little things and they were missing the most important thing, which was Jesus who was right there in front of them. And so the outline today is going to be very, very simple. We're going to look at the priority of the Pharisees that we see in this passage. Then we're going to see the point of some parables that Jesus is going to give within this passage. And then finally, we're going to say some principles that you and I as God's people can take with us as we leave here today and go and live our lives. So that's where we're going. Let's go ahead and pray. And we'll dive into this passage here in Mark chapter 2, verse 18 through 28. So Father, we do thank you for these moments that we share together. We thank you for your word. 
that is before us. And I pray, God, that each of us now in these next few moments will just quiet our hearts, that we will just simply um, just rest before you and allow your spirit just to speak to our heart as your word is open and your word is preached this morning. And so, Father, I pray that you will move me aside, who would help that which I say to edify and glorify you, help it to bring life to your people who are here today. And I pray, Lord God, that each of us can leave here challenged and encouraged and transformed because your word through your spirit has done a work in our hearts today. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So as we begin here, we come to verse 18. It says, Now John's disciples and the Pharisees were fasting. And people came and said to him, Why do John's disciples and the disciples of the Pharisees fast, but your disciples do not fast? And Jesus said to them, Can the wedding guests fast while the bridegroom is with them? As long as they have the bridegroom with them, they cannot fast. Fast, And then you jump over to verse 23. It says, One Sabbath he was going through the grain fields, and as they were on their way, his disciples began to pluck heads of grain. And the Pharisees were saying to him, Look, why are they doing what is not lawful on the Sabbath? And he said to them, Have you never read what David did when he was in need and was hungry? And we'll go on to that story here in just a minute. So in both of these instances, we have a situation where they are going to confront Jesus because Jesus and his disciples are doing or not doing something that they think in their religious tradition they should be doing. So the first thing we need to see from this passage is simply this, the priority of the Pharisees. When you boil the spiritual life of the common Jew down in Jesus' day, you will find that the major emphasis to their religion, to Judaism, was based on being obedient to the Mosaic Law. It was not about developing a deep personal relationship with God, but was about keeping the law. In fact, they were so concerned about obeying the law that they had created all sorts of ridiculous rules to help ensure their obedience and to help them look more spiritual. And so in this passage, we see Jesus confront two important traditions in the life of a Jew, that of fasting and that of the Sabbath. And so the first one there in the opening uh, passage that we read deals with this idea of fasting. Now, I think all of us are probably aware of what fasting is. When we say fasting, we're speaking of this idea of abstaining from food in order to draw closer to God. Now, fasting in of itself is a good thing. It's a good practice. It's something we as believers, as followers of Jesus, should make a part of our spiritual disciplines. It's one of those that maybe many of us don't do as often as we could. And there's many reasons as when you study the Bible as to why you should fast. Um, and so fasting in itself is a good thing. And the Bible speaks much about it. It's a spiritual discipline that we probably should practice more than we do. It helps us eliminate things in our life that may have some controlling power on our lives. If you were here with us back uh, in the beginning of the year, we did 21 days of prayer and fasting. And many of us uh, kind of went without meals or without certain things so we could focus more on Jesus. And I know I found that to be a really beneficial time in my personal walk with Jesus. I hope you did as well if you joined us in that. But the idea here is that you're fasting, you're removing something uh, from your life so that you can focus time and focus energy on drawing near to Jesus. Fasting is scripture, we find, is often accompanied by things like prayer and worship and repentance and mourning. But again, what we need to understand about fasting is that the main focus in fasting is not that of self-denial, but that of drawing close to God. And so the Pharisees were fasting, but they were missing the main point. For them, it was about this idea of self-denial. They were doing these things as a way of outwardly looking religious. For them, it was a show of spirituality. Now, the Pharisees in those days would typically fast two days a week. Most uh, scholars believe that it was probably on Mondays. And Thursdays. In fact, Luke chapter 18 gives us insight into this. It says, Two men went up into the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector, a sinner. The Pharisee, standing by himself, prayed thus, God, I thank you that I am not like the other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. And notice what he says I fast twice a week, I give tithes of all that I get. But the tax collector, standing far off, would not even lift up his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. 
For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. Furthermore, in Matthew 6, it says this, And when you fast, do not look gloomy like the hypocrites, for they disfigure their faces, that their fasting may be seen by others. Truly, I say to you, they have received their reward. But you, when you fast, anoint your head and wash your face, that your fasting may not be seen by others, but by your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. And so understand, when the Pharisees and these religious leaders would fast, they did it really as an outward show of their spirituality. They would disfigure their faces. They would cover themselves with ashes and sackcloth. And they would walk around mourning so that everyone could see that they were withstanding from food. Right? And so it was a religious tradition, a religious practice, but it was without substance. Because they were missing the main point of fasting, which is this attempt to draw closer to God. You're abstaining so that you can focus on the Lord, and they were missing it. And don't you love what Jesus says here? There's no need to fast when the bridegroom is here. So he's going to talk here and, and use this illustration of a wedding when they're asking him, why do John's disciples fast and we fast, but you don't? And Jesus said to them, can the wedding guests fast while the bridegroom is with them? As long as they have the bridegroom with them, they cannot fast. How many of you have ever been to a wedding? Anybody? Okay, most of you. Good, all right. I'm glad you married people are raising your hand. That's good to know that you've been to your own wedding. All right. Now, at a wedding, I don't know about you, but I always enjoy the, the ceremony and I enjoy the opportunity I get to officiate weddings. But for most of us, the best part of the wedding is what? The reception afterwards and the food, right? We all go to a wedding wondering what is the food going to be. Many times you'll get a card in the mail ahead of time saying, do you want the chicken or do you want the beef? And you can decide, yeah, I want this, or I'm going to do both. Give me both when I get there, right? I'm not paying for it. And so you go to a wedding expecting to eat. What would it be like if you went to a wedding and you showed up and you got to the reception and all of a sudden at the table there's a sign that said, thank you for joining us today, but we've decided in lieu of food we are going to fast through our reception. You're going to have water. It would kind of put a damper on the celebration, wouldn't it? And so here what Jesus is saying is, listen, when the bridegroom is in the house, it's a time to celebrate. It's a time to rejoice. It's a time to party. Jesus is saying, listen, my disciples don't need to fast because I am here. I'm with them. It's a time for them to celebrate, to enjoy my presence. He says, the time is coming when they will fast, when I'll be taken away. And in that moment, then they can fast. But right now I am with them and it is a time for them to rejoice, to celebrate. And so I love the picture that Jesus gives. He says, listen, you're fasting, doing all these traditions for really no reason at all. My disciples, a time will come when they fast, but right now I am with them. I am the point of their fasting. So why in the world do they need to fast now when I am here in their midst, in their presence, and it's a time for them to celebrate and rejoice? And so I love Jesus' answer here as he answers these Pharisees. They come in their religious, uh, you know, super spiritual question. Why do we fast? And John's disciples fast, but your disciples don't. And Jesus comes and hits right back and says, listen, there's no need to fast. I'm here. I am the reason for the fasting. And while I'm here, it's a time to celebrate. It's a time to rejoice. And so we see the Pharisees confront him with this issue of fasting. And why is it that we fast, but Jesus, you and your disciples don't? Then we move on in the passage and we see the second issue they confront him in, and that is this issue of the Sabbath. When it came to the Sabbath day, the Pharisees were really even more legalistic than I think they were about fasting. As Jesus' disciples walked through the grain field, they were confronted by the Pharisees because they were plucking grain and eating it. And according to Jewish law, this could be considered working on the Sabbath day. So understand, what the, what the rabbis and the spiritual leaders would do is they would take the Sabbath day and they say, okay, we need to make the Sabbath day holy. And so in order to do that, they would put all these restrictions on the Sabbath day. 
You know, you can only walk so many steps because otherwise you'd be considered working on the Sabbath day. You know, you can't uh, pluck grain because that might be considered harvesting. And so you better not harvest grain because that's working on the Sabbath day. And so they would make all these weird traditions so that they could uphold the law of the Sabbath day. In fact, the Jews were so concerned with keeping the Sabbath that they had created some 39 categories of work that they prohibited in the law so they could keep the Sabbath day. Now, I'm not going to go through all 39 of them with you, but I do think it's interesting some of these categories that they made. One was, some of these were this. One could not climb a tree on the Sabbath, nor ride an animal on the Sabbath, nor swim in the water, nor clap his hands together, nor clap his hand on the thigh, nor dance. You couldn't do anything on those, those things on the Sabbath because that was too much like working. Okay, when it came to reaping laws, according to Jewish traditions, one who reaps an amount the size of a dried fig is liable. Plucking fruit is considered a derivative of reaping. Similarly, any person who removes produce from where it is growing is liable for reaping. Therefore, a person who removes grass from a growing rock, a parasite plant that grows on shrubs, or grasses that grow on a barrel is liable. For this is a place where they grow. And so they had all these weird, crazy laws so that they could keep the main law of the Sabbath. Because God had said, remember the Sabbath day, keep it holy, right? So they see that and they say, well, we want to make sure we don't break it. So they put all these other ridiculous laws in place to keep them from breaking the Sabbath day. And these traditions became so much a part of their life that that became more of the focus than the point of the Sabbath day. They were missing the forest for the trees, both in the area of fasting and now in the area of the Sabbath. And notice Jesus' response to these legalists. I love what he says here. And he said to them, have you never read what David did? Now think about who he's talking to. He is talking to the Pharisees, the religious elite of his day, those who would have memorized scripture, those who have known well what the Bible said. And he says, have you not read what David did? And he's taking it back to the one they elevated as king, right? David, he is the most prominent figure in Judaism. And he says, have you not read what David did with his men when he was hungry? Let's look at it in 1 Samuel. It says in 1 Samuel 21, Then David came to Nob. This is when he's on the run, uh, uh, running away from Saul. Then David came to Nob to Ahimelech, the priest. And Ahimelech came to meet David, trembling, and said to him, Why are you alone and no one with you? And David said to Ahimelech, the priest, The king has charged me with a matter and said to me, Let no one know anything of the matter about which I send you and with which I have charged you. I have made an appointment with the young men for such and such a place. Now then, what have you on hand? Give me five loaves of bread or whatever is here. And the priest answered, David, I have no common bread on hand, but there is holy bread if the young men have kept themselves from women. And David answered the priest, truly women have been kept from us as always when I go on an expedition. The wheels of the young men or the vessels of the young men are holy, even when it is an ordinary journey. How much more today will their vessels be holy? So the priest gave him the holy bread. For there was no bread there, but the bread of the presence, which is removed from before the Lord, to be replaced by the hot bread on the day it is taken away. So if you didn't follow what's happening here, David shows up at, at the, the temple there, and he finds that he, he's hungry. His men have been traveling. They've been running from Saul. They don't have anything to eat. And so he shows up and says to the high priest, is there anything here to eat? Any bread that we can have? We're starving. We're, we need some food. The priest says, we have no common bread. All we have is a holy show bread that is here in the temple that people were not supposed to eat. It was for the priest. It was set aside. It was holy. But yet, because of David's hunger, the priest said, here, you have this bread and you eat it. And so the Pharisees look back and they were able to excuse that in David's instance, right? Now here we are fast forwarding back to Jesus' day. And so Jesus is going to use this as an example. He's going to let them know, hey, don't you remember what happened to David and his men when they were hungry? How they ate the showbread that was there in the temple? And yet you excuse that because they were in need. And now here you are trying to say that my disciples can't just pick grain off the grain field as we're walking and, and eat it. 
So again, they made all these laws, all these stipulations, all these rules so that they could keep the Sabbath day. And then Jesus goes on, and I love how he continues to answer this in verse 27. And he said to them, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord, even of the Sabbath. And so here we again have Jesus claiming before them that he is God in the flesh, right? That's what he's saying when he says, I am Lord of the Sabbath. But he, he reminds them, listen, you've made all these rules. You become so legalistic in what you do that you've forgotten the whole point of the Sabbath. The Sabbath was meant to be a blessing, a day of rest, a day for you to rest and to focus on Jesus and to rest from your work. But you have made it a burden. You're trying to keep from all these things and it's become a burden to you instead of a blessing. And so they had missed the main idea of the Sabbath and all these rules and laws that they have created. So understand here, the priority of the Pharisees that we see in this passage is they were all about keeping traditions of man. Now, the traditions were set up with the right motive in mind, right? Like when it came to fasting and when it came to Sabbath, they had the right motive in mind originally, but it had gone so far they'd create all these laws that all these things had become a burden to them or a sign of just great spirituality. And Jesus says, you are missing the point. These things were supposed to be a blessing, but you have made them a burden. And so we see here um, the priority of the Pharisees is they were stooped in tradition and religion, and they were missing the most important thing, which was Jesus and drawing close to God. That's why we have a Sabbath day of rest. That's why we rest, so we can focus on the Lord. That's why we fast. Not so we can just abstain from all these things and look spiritual on the outside, but no, so we can draw closer to God spiritually and allow our hearts to just draw nearer to Him as we abstain from things that we would regularly partake of. So we see the priority of the Pharisees was these religious traditions that they have created, and they've missed the main point of what God had intended. Secondly, we're going to look now at the point of Jesus' parables. Notice what he says here at the end of that first section of Scripture when he's talking about fasting. He's going to give a couple parables here that we sometimes just read over. After he talks about the idea of the bridegroom and how his disciples don't need to fast now because he's in their presence, in verse 21 he says, No one sews a piece of unshrunk cloth on an old garment. If he does, the patch tears away from it, the new from the old, and a worse tear is made. And no one puts new wine into old wineskins. If he does, the wine will burst the skins, and the wine is destroyed, and so are the skins. But new wine is for fresh wineskins. So Jesus here is going to give two parables. Tucked within this passage are a couple of interesting parables that Jesus uses to prove his point that he is trying to make to the Pharisees. One is about this patch that is being sewn on an old garment. Maybe I'm dating myself a little bit, but I remember when I was a little kid, if I would get a hole in my jeans, my mom on occasion would take out a patch. Anybody know what I'm talking about? And she would then put that patch onto that hole to help kind of preserve my jeans, right? But the problem is that Jesus is saying, when you have this new patch and you try to put it on these old clothes, what's going to happen is it's going to stretch that and it's not going to be productive. It says, no one sews a piece of unshrunk cloth on an old garment. If he does, the patch tears away from it, the new from the old, and a worse tear is made. And so he's using this parable to prove a point. And his point was that Jesus did not come to patch up an old religious system. He didn't come to improve the old system. He came to bring something completely new. So he wasn't coming to their religious set of traditions, and he wasn't trying to patch it up and fix all the holes. No, he came to bring something completely new. And I love what this quote says by David Guzik. He says this, You can't fit his new life into old forms. Jesus traded fasting for feasting, sackcloth and ashes for a robe of righteousness, a spirit of heaviness for a garment of praise, mourning for joy and law for grace. Isn't that good? 
That's what Jesus came to do, not just to patch up some old religious system based on works and effort and all those things that they were trying. Jesus came to bring something better, something new. So what he's saying is, listen, we don't just add Jesus to our life. And I find that that's what many people want to do, right? They want to make God this genie in a bottle that I'm going to keep doing what I want to do. I'm going to keep living my life and I'll kind of just add Jesus in and hope that my life becomes better. That's not what it's about. Jesus doesn't want you just to add him to your life. He wants to become your life. He wants you to surrender your life to him. The illustration I use many times is it's like this pie pan, right? And so often we want to look at our life in all these categories, my friends and my job and my hobbies, and we have all these pieces of pie, and then we make Jesus a part of our pie, right? And maybe some of us say, oh, he's a big part of my pie, though. Like, he's, he's a big piece. But Jesus is saying, no, I don't want to just be a piece of your life. I want to be the pie pan that holds everything together. I will be the source of everything. From everything will flow out of me. That's what he says. He wants us to surrender our life to him. He wants to be our life. And that is what he is saying here. Don't just add me to your life, but allow me to become your life. Surrender everything to me. Allow me to become the Lord of your life. Life. So he didn't come just to fix up some religious system. He didn't come just to be added into our life. He came because he wants to give us a new life, an eternal life that can only be found in him. And that's why Paul says, I crucify the old man, right? And I live for Christ. Jesus is teaching that religious deeds will get us nowhere unless there is first a relationship with him. And so that's what he's trying to teach us with these parables. The first one being that about the patch. The second one being that about uh, putting new wine into old wineskin. He's saying, listen, you don't put this new wine and all the fermentation, everything that needs to happen into old wineskins because they would burst. Right? And so he's saying, listen, I came to bring something new. I'm not going to fit into your old religious system. I'm not going to fit into, you know, all these categories you were trying to put me in. I came to give you new life, to give you eternal life. And that life can only be found in Jesus. And so he gives these parables to prove a point to the Pharisees that, hey, listen, you're doing all these religious deeds externally, but I came to give you new life on the inside, a life that is eternal, a life that goes beyond just mere religious deeds that you are doing. Does that make sense? And so here he gives us these parables to help prove this point to the Pharisees. And then finally, as I close, because this is kind of one of those weird passages, right? We've, we've seen a lot of different stuff up to this point, and now we have Jesus talking to the Pharisees. And most of us wait, well, I don't fit in that boat. I'm not a Pharisee. I'm not, you know, a, a person like that. And so what are some applications here that I can take for my life? Well, I think there's several things we need to kind of draw from this as we look at our own life. So what are some principles that we as God's people can draw from this passage? Well, the first one is I think we need to recognize the difference between religion and the gospel. We need to recognize the difference between religion and the gospel. Right? There are a lot of religions that are out there. And a lot of religions promote similar things. In fact, I was talking to somebody yesterday who kind of had this mindset and talked about how it seems like a lot of religions have kind of the same basic tenets. But what they didn't realize is that Christianity is different because it's not about religion at all. It's about relationships. So recognize the difference between your religion and the gospel. And I found this chart that I think will be helpful. I'm sorry it's a little blurry, but I hope you can still read it. It says this. In religion, it says, if I obey, I'm accepted. Right? You've seen religions like that. I have to do certain things or, you know, obey these certain things, and I'll eventually earn God's favor. I have to work my way to God. Well, with the gospel, it says I'm accepted because of what Jesus did, and therefore I obey. That's a big difference, right? One says, I obey so that I'm accepted. Christianity says, I'm accepted already because of Christ, therefore I obey. Let's go on. Religion says, if I'm good, God will love me. The gospel says, I already know I'm bad, and God loves me anyways. 
I know I'm bad, but God loves bad people. That's why he came. That's what we looked at last week, right? He came for the sinner. He is the great physician. I came to seek and to save the lost. The gospel says, I know I'm bad, but that's the kind of people Jesus came to save. Religion says that people are in one of two categories, either good or bad. The gospel says the two categories are repentant or unrepentant. Those who have recognized Jesus as the one to forgive their sins and those who haven't. Right? Those are the two categories. Not good people and bad people, but those who have accepted Christ and those who have not. What's the focus of religion? Well, it's on what I do or I don't do. Right? And you're constantly trying to perform. You're constantly trying to do certain things or keep from doing certain things. With the gospel, the focus is on what Jesus did. He died on the cross. He forgave me. It's all about what he did. Nothing about what I do. Well, what does religion produce? One of two things. Either pride because, hey, look at me. I'm keeping all the traditions. I'm keeping all the rules. I'm doing good. I'm checking all these boxes. Or it produces despair. I can never measure up. Or probably a combination of both. Well, I do some right, and, but I fall short in a lot. And so there's this constant battle of pride and despair. What does the gospel produce? Humility and confidence because we recognize it's not about anything I can do anyways. It's all about what Christ has done. And so I enter life humbly, but with confidence because I know my eternity is secure because of what Jesus Christ has done for me. Religion is motivated by fear, while the gospel is motivated by love. Man, isn't that good? Isn't that a good chart I found? And I'm like, man, that nails it. The difference between religion and the gospel and how many people do you know in your life who are entrapped by religion who desperately could use the freedom that the gospel brings? So what is a takeaway or what is a principle that we need to draw from this passage as Jesus confronts these Pharisees? Well, first of all, we need to recognize what is the difference between religion and the gospel or religion and a true relationship with Jesus? All these things is what we see the difference is. A second principle or takeaway, I think, is that we need to recognize the dangers of legalism. These Pharisees were blinded. They were entrapped by the laws they were trying to keep, by the traditions that were made by man. And if we're honest with ourselves, there's a part of us that kind of craves legalism. What, what do I mean? Well... In life, we are accustomed to things being performance-based, aren't we? Think about when you were in school. You didn't just get an A for only showing up. You had to do the work, right? If you failed a test, your grade reflected it. Performance-based. Think about your job. If you call out every day, if you call out every day, you're not going to get promoted. But the reality is that if you perform and you do well, you're going to get promoted. So there's performance in your job, right? Most things in life are a meritocracy. If I do well, I will get elevated. But when it comes to the gospel and it comes to a relationship with Jesus, it's not that way. Because no matter what we do, we can never be good enough. And so we need to recognize the dangers of legalism. And that is we are accustomed to a life that is performance-based. But Christianity has nothing to do with your performance. It's all about what Jesus did. Another reason it can be so dangerous is because we can find comfort in rules and boundaries, can't we? When we know what the rule is and we know what the boundary is, there can be some comfort there. Okay, I know where I'm at. I know where I fall. Okay, I know this is the boundary and I need to make sure I don't cross it. And so there can be comfort in rules and in boundaries. And so that's a danger of legalism. These Pharisees were keeping a, a box, right? Well, I'm doing all these things. But that's not what it's about. What's another danger of legalism? Well, I think if we're not careful, we can have a tendency to judge others according to our legalistic standards, right? 
Ever met people who held you to the same standard they, they had, but yet it wasn't anywhere in the Bible? Right? And sometimes that's the problem with legalism. Again, not that standards are bad. If God convicts your heart and you have a standard, that, that's okay if it's helping you accomplish the ultimate goal, right, of becoming more like Jesus. But the problem is that, hey, don't hold other people to your unbiblical standard. Does that make sense? And I find so often, and again, this is still something I, I'm working uh, through. I came from a background that was extremely entrenched with a lot of legalism. You know, I had to have, you know, the right version of the Bible. I went to a college that was extremely conservative and had all these different rules in place. And, you know, and it was, it, it was very easy to judge other people based on your standards. And again, not that the standards are bad, but just be careful when it comes to judging other people that we judge them based on the Bible and not based on a standard you've set up for yourself. Right? And this can look in many different ways, and this applies to many different areas of life, but I think that's a danger of legalism. We have this tendency to judge others based on our legalistic rules or traditions. Another thing it can do if we're not careful is it can give us a tendency to judge how God should respond to us based on our legalism. We can kind of get the mindset, well, God, if I'm doing this, then you need to respond in this way. Again, and that's a danger of legalism. We're expecting God to act in a certain way because we are doing whatever it is. Does that all make sense? So we need to be careful. As we are confronted with these Pharisees, we need to understand that legalism can very easily creep up in our lives as well because we like rules, we like boundaries, everything in our life is performance-based. And so it'd be nice in some ways if our Christianity did function that way. But it's not about our performance, it's about what Jesus did. And then yes, he says, be holy as I am holy, and then we live and we look at his word and we obey. But it's not vice versa, it's not, well, I'm gonna obey and then that's gonna get me close to Jesus. No, it's, I'm gonna draw close to Jesus and then I'm gonna obey and strive to be holy. So we need to recognize the difference between religion and the gospel. We need to recognize the dangers of legalism. And then we need to simply recognize the demand for a genuine relationship with Jesus. You see, legalism robs us of joy because we can never fully measure up. But a true relationship with God is based on grace and what Jesus has already done, not on what we do. I love what G.K. Chesterton said. He said this, let your religion be less of a theory and more of a love affair. And that's what it should be when it comes to our quote-unquote religion. Right? It's all about loving Jesus more deeply and more intimately and drawing closer to him and less about all the things we think we have to do or not do. That's where the Pharisees were. They thought that it was all about checking off these boxes. Well, we're fasting, and we're keeping the Sabbath, and we're doing all these things. And then here are your disciples. They're not fasting, and they're picking grain on Sabbath day. We're so much more spiritual than your disciples. And Jesus is going to poke holes in them saying, listen, you're missing the forest for the trees. You have all these rules and regulations and traditions, but you're missing the point of them. The point of fasting is to draw close to me. The point of the Sabbath is to allow me to be your rest. And these things that have been meant to be a blessing have become a burden because you put all of man's traditions in and straight away from the gospel of grace. And so my question for each of us is, have we allowed legalism? Have we allowed traditions? Have we allowed religion to seep into what should be a genuine relationship with God? And if so, maybe it's time that we repent. Maybe it's time that we say, God, I realize that I'm trying to be religious instead of just striving to be in a relationship with you. Because if we're not careful, all of us are prone to lean towards the behavior of these Pharisees. Because that can be a comfortable place. It can be a safe place. 
because it's what we're used to. But Jesus says, listen, a relationship with me shatters all of that. It's not about religion. It's about the gospel. It's about a relationship with me. And the Pharisees are missing it. And all their rules, all their traditions, all the quote-unquote religious things they think they're doing, they're missing it. And they're not getting to enjoy the beauty of fasting. They're not getting to enjoy the beauty of Sabbath because they've messed it up with all these other traditions that they've put in place. So I hope that we can examine our own lives and see, have I kind of fallen prey to legalism? Have I fallen prey to religious deeds? And if so, maybe it's time I need to focus back on my relationship with God and understand it's about him and what he did. It's about a love for him. That's what motivates me to obey and to walk in obedience. It's not the other way around. So again, examine your own heart. And if there's a decision you need to make to repent of some of those things, allow this to be an opportunity for you to do that. Maybe you're here today or you're watching online and you've never trusted in Jesus and a relationship with him. You've never, you know, allowed that to be your foundation. You've been clinging to religion. Well, if I can just be good enough, then one day I'll get to heaven. That's not going to cut it, friend. It's not about being good enough because you can never be good enough. It's not about how many times you go to church. It's not about how many times you read your Bible. It's not about any of that. It's about have you trusted in a sacrifice that Jesus made on the cross for your sins and for mine? Because the only way our sin can be forgiven is through what Jesus did on the cross. And if you're relying on anything else, you're no better off than the Pharisees. And you're missing the point as to why Jesus came. So, Father, thank you for the truth that we see in your word today. Thank you for, Father God, just the reality we see in Scripture before us. Lord, it's so easy to focus on religion. It's so easy to focus on what we can do and a performance-based religion. But, Lord, what you came to give us is grace. What you came to give us is an abundant life that is found in a deep abiding relationship with you. And so God, I pray for myself. I pray for each of my friends who are here today or those who are listening online. And I pray that you will help each of us, Lord God, to not be like these Pharisees, to not be so caught up with our performance or our religion or our man-made traditions that we miss out on that which is most important. And that is a relationship with you. So God, I pray that you will work in our hearts. Father, maybe we need to do better about fasting, but we need to do it for the right reasons. Maybe for some of us, we're so busy, we need to take time to have a Sabbath day of rest. Lord, maybe you've used this message to, Lord God, just challenge us in those areas. Father, whatever it is, I pray that each of us, as we sing this final song of response, that you will help us to respond to your spirit so that we can leave here transformed, we can leave here changed, we can leave here with a greater desire to serve and to worship you. Because God, it's not about religion, it's about a relationship with you. So thank you that you've done everything to make that relationship possible. And it's in Jesus' precious name we pray, amen.